let's get started. We have been looking forward to this presentation, I don't know, maybe for almost a year now. And we're thrilled to have with us, if not in person, virtually, uh, Megan Kate Nelson, who was actually born in Colorado Springs and grew up in Littleton, Colorado. She is now a writer and historian living in Lincoln, Massachusetts, and her new book, The Three-Cornered War, The Union, The Confederacy, and Native Peoples in the Fight for the West, was just published by Scribner um, in February of 2020. The project was a recipient of a 2017 prestigious NEH Public Scholar Award and a Filson Historical Society Fellowship. Dr. Nelson is the author of two previous books, Ruin Nation, Destruction in the American Civil War, and Trembling Earth, A Cultural History of the Okafenoki, I think I got that right, Swamp. <laughs> um, <laughs> excellent. She's also written about the Civil War, the US West, and American culture for publications like the New York Times, Washington Post, Smithsonian Magazine, Preservation Magazine, and Civil War Times. Her column on Civil War popular culture titled Stereoscope appears regularly in the Civil War Monitor. Uh, Dr. Uh, Megan Kate Nelson, we're thrilled that you're here. And without further ado, um, please take it away. All right, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Leah. And thank you to everyone for being here today. I really wish I could be with you in person. Um, I love coming home to Colorado uh, and going down to the Springs uh, to see all of my good friends there um, and to be at the, the Pioneers Museum. Um, so maybe, hopefully, we will cross our fingers that at some point, uh, sooner rather than later, I can actually be there in person and perhaps uh, meet some of you. But um, I want to thank Leah for inviting me to be part of this scholar series. Um, it is a great honor um, to be here with you. Um, and thank you also to Meg Poole for setting everything up. I know that uh, these strange times have sort of moved us into this weird digital realm um, <laughs> that it takes uh, some getting used to. And so um, I'm really glad that this could all work out today so that I could introduce uh, all of you to uh, the Three Cornered War and its arguments and um, some of the protagonists in it. So um, I think what's going to happen now, I'm just going to talk for about 20 to 25 minutes uh, about the book overall and then Leah and I will have a short conversation and then we'll open it up to questions. So uh, let me share my screen with you again. So that we can see this. All right, thank you. So, uh, yes, so here is uh, the cover of The Three Cornered War, which came out uh, in February 2020 with Scribner. And the book tells the story of the American Civil War in the Far West, uh, which is a theater of the war, um, I imagine all of you know. Uh, does not get talked about a lot, um, either in Civil War books or films uh, or classrooms, really. And this is actually what drew me to this topic. Um, as Leah mentioned, I grew up in Colorado. And when I first started uh, kind of doing a lot of Civil War studies, I was reading pretty widely um, in preparation for my previous book, Ruin Nation, and also for teaching Civil War classes. And I ran into uh, these accounts of the battles that took place in New Mexico territory. And I was just kind of blown away because I had no idea uh, that these battles took place in New Mexico and that Colorado soldiers, most of them gold miners, had taken part in it and in fact played a major role in uh, defending the West against a Confederate invasion. And, you know, whenever historians figure out there's something they they didn't know about before. Um, they're always very interested. And so I kind of took that. And because I was, you know, I'm from Colorado, I had this personal interest uh, in the topic, but I really wanted to know what actually happened um, during the Civil War in the Far West and why the West was important. Um, so I started doing the research. Um, and one of my first major questions was, you know, why would the Union and the Confederacy be interested in the West in the first place, right? Um, it's 40% of the nation's land mass, but um, is not um, settled with the same density as the East and the Southeast. And so this was really the first driving question. And what I figured out is that both the Union and the Confederacy wanted the control of the Far West for a couple of reasons. One, for gold, 
um, all the mines in uh, California and also Colorado, and then about halfway through the war in Montana, uh, what became Montana Territory. And then also for Pacific ports. Uh, and this was particularly critical for the Confederacy because already the Union had established, was starting to establish a really effective blockade of ports on the, the Eastern seaboard and then also in the Gulf. And so if the Confederacy could get a hold of those deep water ports uh, outside of San Diego and, and Los Angeles, they would be able to ship their cotton um, out to Asia and then also a uh, roundabout uh, way to Europe. And as we all know, I think, uh, it takes money to fight wars. And uh, here again, the Confederacy was in greater need uh, than the Union. And, but both sides actually were very interested in funding their individual war efforts through um, control of the Far West. Um, but interestingly, what I also found out is that both the Union and the Confederacy also thought of the Far West when they were thinking about their plans for the future. So for the Union, uh, the West, they had been arguing for, for more than 10 years, should be free territory, which meant, of course, a territory free of slavery. And they saw the West as a place uh, to settle with white farmers and miners and ranchers, uh, and that this would be a landscape of freedom. For the Confederacy, the Far West was part of their long-term vision of an empire of slavery that they would extend from coast to coast. And then if they were able to win the West, they could really start expanding southward into Mexico and the Caribbean. Uh, so this is something also, and, and one of the other kind of questions that I had about why Civil War historians don't talk about the West um, very much is that we're always talking about the West in the years coming up to the Civil War, right? The, the arguments about whether the Western territories and states are going to be free or slave states and territories was really driving the division in the country. Um, but then suddenly, you know, there's a firing on Fort Sumter and everyone stops, stops talking about the West. Um, but one of the major contentions in the book is that they didn't stop thinking about the West. In fact, uh, the West was still on everyone's minds in the East and both the Union and the Confederacy wanted control of that region. So why did the Confederates, this is another question, why did the Confederates think that they even had a chance, right? Um, well, also for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is, you know, as, as the slide here says, the West was really up for grabs. There were three major populations uh, in the Far West at this point, whose loyalties were really uncertain. Um, miners in gold camps um, and other mineral camps all across the West had come from the South and the North and the Midwest. Um, so there were a lot of fights in those camps at the beginning of the war about whether they were gonna raise the Union flag or the Confederate flag. Also, Mormons in Utah, who really had control um, of the overland trail through that part of the West, had very recently kind of fought their own war against the US government. So the Confederates thought, maybe we can win the, that particular population uh, with all of their access and control to our side. And then there were the hundreds of native uh, peoples, uh, tribes living throughout the far West, who had all of them very different relationships with the US government. Some had been fighting the government for years, some had alliances, and uh, it really was unclear uh, which indigenous uh, communities would either go with the Union if the or the Confederacy if pressed, right? Or if they would continue to do as they'd always done and fight for their own sovereignty and their own people. So, in the, in the spring and summer of 1861, the Confederacy really thought they had a chance to win the West uh, for their nation. Um, so I'm just gonna give you a quick overview of what happened from that point on. Um, the book goes into pretty uh, granular detail about all of these um, clashes and campaigns between uh, what turned out to be 1861 to 1866 uh, in New Mexico territory. So uh, in July of 1861, the first Confederate uh, army invaded 
New Mexico Territory under John Robert Baylor, uh, took control of the town of Mesilla, forced the surrender of Fort Fillmore and 400 of its Union soldiers. And then John Baylor sat down and created uh, the Confederate Territory of Arizona, which you can see on this military map from 1862, this pink section. Uh, New Mexico, Confederate Arizona was actually the, the kind of this southern slice of what was then New Mexico territory in total. And so by the summer of 1861, the Confederacy actually extended from the Atlantic to the Colorado River. Following Baylor was a 3,000 man army from Texas uh, under Henry Hopkins Sibley. Uh, and that army arrived in December of 1861 and January of 1862. And that army went on to fight uh, a Union force at, in three different battles. Valverde, Apache Canyon, and Glorieta Pass. The Confederates were victorious at Valverde. Uh, they occupied, took and occupied Albuquerque and then Santa Fe, uh, and then clashed again with a different Union army made up mostly of Colorado gold miners at Apache Canyon and Glorieta Pass. And at Glorieta, they actually won the battle, but were kind of turned away um, by a force of Coloradans who successfully flanked them and burned their entire wagon train. And as many of you know, uh, the high desert of the far west can be very unforgiving. And the Confederate army without their wagon train really had no hope of conquering the west because they could not support themselves and they would die in the desert. So starting in April of 1862, they started the very long retreat, more than 1,000 miles um, back from uh, Santa Fe all the way to San Antonio, Texas. At that same time, a California uh, army was marching more than 800 miles from Los Angeles to the Rio Grande um, to try and help the Union push back uh, the Confederates. They never got to actually fight any Texans, uh, but they did arrive in August of 1862. And their commander, James Henry Carlton, took command of the Department of New Mexico uh, in the fall of 1862, and then he turned all those Union soldiers toward a different enemy. And this is why the book is called The Three-Cornered War, uh, which is actually a term that a California soldier used to describe the conflict in this region. Uh, because all along, Mescalero Apaches, Chiricahua Apaches, and Navajos had been uh, raiding both Union and Confederate wagon trains and uh, forts and corrals, and really kind of bringing more chaos uh, to that campaign that we're used to seeing in the Eastern theater. Uh, so Carleton turned the Union Army's full attention um, on these indigenous groups from the fall of 1862 to the fall of 1866, and um, forced uh, Mescalero Apaches and Navajos, uh, many of them to surrender, moved them to a reservation on the Pecos River uh, called Bosque Redondo. Uh, they never fully uh, were able to defeat uh, the Chiricahua Apaches and there the Apaches war with the U.S. Army continued um, past 1868 in fact for another 20 years. So this is obviously a very big story. It has a lot of working parts, a lot of different communities involved um, who are engaging with each other in multiple ways across a really vast landscape. And so my real challenge in thinking about how I was going to tell the story was how to give uh, readers a sense of the kind of scope and scale of this conflict, but then also give you a, a real sense of what it was like to be there on the ground. Um, and as I was trying to figure out how to write this book, I had been reading a lot of fiction, um, including, and this is, I know, very lowbrow, but uh, Game of Thrones, which uh, if those of you who have either seen uh, the show or read the novels uh, know that there are hundreds of characters in those books. Uh, but what George R. R. Martin does is that he uh, uses multiple perspectives to tell you that story. And so I decided, you know, if George R. R. Martin could do it with hundreds of characters, I could do it with nine. Um, so in The Three Cornered War, the reader follows nine different people. And each of them, you kind of are on the ground with each of them at multiple times um, over the course of the conflict in the Southwest. And I just wanted to introduce you to three of the nine today to just give you a flavor if you haven't read the book yet, um, to just give you a sense of the, the kind of people who are in the book and, and why I chose them as, as protagonists. So first, 
Uh, we have John Baylor. I've already talked about him a little bit because I knew I wanted to start the book uh, with Baylor and his invasion of New Mexico territory in July of 1861. Uh, Baylor was actually born in Kentucky, uh, but he migrated with his family to Texas in the 1840s. And they were really drawn there by this lure of uh, cotton land and the ability to own slaves because Texas had liberated itself uh, from Mexico by this point and had um, established that slavery was legal in the state of Texas. So Baylor came with his family, um, actually Baylor University, if many of you know that, is named after one of his uncles. So very prominent family. He became a farmer and a rancher. Uh, he enslaved black men and women in both of those ventures. He uh, read for the law, became a lawyer, was elected to the state legislature. Uh, and in 1860, uh, after moving his family uh, to ranch land, uh, kind of northwest of Houston, uh, he, or actually Dallas, uh, he edited a magazine uh, or a newspaper called The White Man, uh, which really functioned solely to whip up a kind of furor against Comanches, who at that point claimed as their territory uh, much of northern and western Texas. Uh, so Baylor participated in a kind of proto-Texas Rangers uh, kind of activity, went riding out after Comanches um, and pursuing them and riding them down. So by the spring of 1861, Baylor was really primed uh, to join the Confederate Army in defense of slavery and secession uh, and the right of white people to take lands away from indigenous communities. Um, by all accounts, Baylor was a charismatic uh, leader of his soldiers um, and a pretty capable commander, uh, but he was also ambitious and petty and prone to great personal violence. And this, these aspects of his character really drove uh, most of his actions in New Mexico territory in 1861 and 1862. Juanita was just a teenager uh, when she married Manuelito, one of the more prominent headmen um, in the Navajo community. Uh, by that point, she was already an accomplished weaver. And the photograph you see uh, of her here is actually from the 1870s. Um, but she is wearing a dress that she has woven herself, and she's surrounded um, by several of her textiles. And she married Manuelito right before the war began. Um, and readers will follow her and her husband and her children um, as they engage with the Union Army throughout the Civil War in New Mexico. And the reason I chose Juanita was because I wanted to give readers um, a civilian viewpoint um, in the Navajo story. And I also wanted to be able to highlight the very important role that women play, uh, played and do play in Navajo culture, especially in their production of these textiles, which became extremely important in the trade uh, networks in the region. Uh, so Juanita helped to keep the sheep herd, then um, she spun, uh, the wool into thread and then she wove it into blankets that then entered this kind of region-wide trade and really bolstered um, the power of her family and her band. Uh, so readers will follow her um, really from the beginning of the book, but her story really dominates kind of the, the last half or a third um, of the book as uh, the Union Army begins their Navajo campaign in earnest and Juanita and her family kind of both evade um, and then negotiate uh, with the Union Army and ultimately surrender uh, in the fall of 1866 and are forced on the long walk to Bosque Redondo and then live at that reservation, which is really was really a prison camp um, and turned into a great um, kind of terrible, tragic place um, that Navajos called Whaldy or the land of suffering. Um, so, Juanita's story, I think, of her kind of wartime experiences is one of great suffering, but also one of persistence and survival. And for that reason, I think she is, and her story is really the heart of the book. And finally, uh, I wanted to introduce you to Alonzo Ickes. Um, 
I first ran into uh, Alonzo uh, at the Denver Public Library, actually. I was visiting my parents in 2010, and even though I was finishing up the writing of my previous book, I was already thinking about this one, and I wanted to see what the DPL had in terms of sources um, for Civil War soldiers. And one of the things I found there was this diary um, that Alonzo Ickes had written uh, during, it was mostly during the New Mexico campaign, um, it kind of tracks him through his mustering into the Union Army uh, out of Canyon City and Fort Garland uh, in October and November of 1861. And Alonzo Ickes was actually in Colorado. Uh, he's not born in Colorado, obviously, but he had been, uh, he came from Iowa with his brother Jonathan in the spring of 1859 as part of the Colorado Gold Rush. And I was captivated by his story, and not only because his diary is very vivid, he doesn't really hold anything back, he really tells you what all those soldiers were up to, which was mostly no good. Um, a lot of drinking, a lot of dancing, um, he did not hold back uh, in his kind of racist assessments of the Hispano soldiers who were serving with him. Um, and for a historian, that kind of source is, is an amazing source uh, because it gives you a really good kind of realistic sense of soldiers in the field. Um, but I was also interested in him because, I, again, the Colorado Gold Rush is something I don't think we talk about very much. I mean, I remember as a kid learning about, you know, silver mines um, and all of the, the kind of silver boom towns and ghost towns in Colorado. But I think California sort of hogs all of the, the American gold rush stories, I think, from 1849. So it was really interesting to read all of these histories of the Colorado Rush of 58, 59. And of course, what this meant was that there were tens of thousands of young men of military age uh, in the Rocky Mountains and in Denver City when the war broke out. And so they were there, they, and for, in terms of, of Ickes, he volunteered in October of 1861. Um, he did it out of duty. He really felt that he had a duty to, to serve the Union. Um, but he also was looking at a, at a winter of you know, non-productivity, he wasn't gonna get any mining done, and he really, he and Jonathan had not been very successful in their mining venture. So serving in the Union Army looked pretty, pretty good to them at this point. Um, he and his fellow miners, actually Jonathan went home to Iowa, so he didn't serve with Alonzo uh, in his unit. But uh, readers will follow Alonzo Ickes um, from his mustering point in Canyon City down to Fort Garland, then Santa Fe. And then you will see his, the, the Battle of Valverde, um, partly from Alonzo Ickes's perspective. Uh, and then his uh, company remains in New Mexico through November of 1862, uh, when James Carleton kicks them out uh, and sends them east into Colorado and then even further east uh, to fight Confederate guerrillas. Um, because they had, you'll, and you'll see when you read the book, uh, they engage in some very bad behavior uh, that justifies them getting kicked out of Colorado. Um, but what Ickes' story enabled me to do was to really talk about um, Union soldiers on the ground and then also really highlight the important role of gold and gold mining um, in shaping the Civil War in the Far West. So just to kind of conclude a little bit here, um, the Three Cornered War is really about looking at the Civil War from unexpected places. Um, and what happens when we do that? What kind of different perspective do we get on the Civil War uh, when we see it from the Southwest um, and not from the battlefields of Virginia. Um, and one of the major things I think we learn is that the Civil War really was a three-cornered war. It was um, a fight that involved both the North, the South, and the West, um, fought by Union and Confederate and Native uh, peoples. Um, and it involved Anglos and Hispanos and Indigenous peoples on the ground. Um, so those are kind of three different um, takes on the Three Cornered War. Um, it also shows us something interesting about the Union War. I mean, I think we're used to talking about uh, Union goals as focusing on emancipation in the East. But when we look at the war from New Mexico, we see that the Union was similarly invested 
in either the extermination or the removal of native peoples in the West. And that really complicates our notion of the Union's just war. Um, we also, I think, learn uh, the very important role of natural resources and climate in shaping the way that people fight wars and their reasons for being in certain theaters to fight wars. Uh, and finally, I think it just shows us that the Civil War was a truly continental conflict, uh, that everyone who lived uh, in, you know, the, in the border and sometimes across the borders of the United States uh, were a part of this most fundamental uh, event in American history. So I will stop there uh, and uh, let everybody kind of marinate and, um, and uh, have a conversation now with Leah. Excellent. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Megan. I cannot believe that we were lucky enough to get a scholar of your stature to, to be a part of our 2020 scholar series at the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum, so I'm thrilled. While you and I chat, go ahead and use, um, for audience members, go ahead and use that chat function to send me your questions, and I will ask them of Megan in just a, a few moments. Um, I love this notion of that you describe in the book of how the imagined west influences both the north and the south um but you're a westerner mm -hmm. how does how did being a westerner shape the book and um, did it change the way you saw the story i think that because i was coming from the west i did not have um until I started to do the research. I didn't feel like I had any real ownership of Civil War history, if that makes sense. Um, because I felt like it was a conflict that had happened entirely in the East and some parts of the Trans-Mississippi West, really, and that I had no real connection, um, personal connection to that conflict. And so when I started to do the research for it, it was just really great to be able to um, track the Civil War through places that I know, right? So, and I was able to, to drive out in the, in the fall, the summer and fall of 2014, I did my major research trip and I drove out from Boston, uh, stayed with my parents um, for a little bit and did research here. And then I drove through the entire Southwest going from archive to library, uh, to museums, um, looking at sources and then also driving through the landscape. And I think, that to me was such a joy because I love, I love Colorado and I love the far west. Um, I always feel really at home when I'm there. And so the ability to go there and be on the ground and really as a, a Westerner understand um, really deeply how things like aridity and elevation can really affect you physically and affect uh, all kinds of things. There's a scene in the book where the Confederate wagons are falling apart because they were built of, of wood um, from East Texas, which once it gets high and dry, it starts to shrink and it's like spitting out nails and all the wagons are falling apart. And, you know, I think as Westerners, we understand um, the, effect, the effects of the, the high desert climate in that way. And as an environmental historian, I'm, I'm very much shaped by that and by that perspective um, of the West. And I think it also just enabled me to, um, to look at the Civil War. I, I think I more easily kind of accepted that the West played a role, as you were saying, in the imagination and then also in the, the planning and the strategy of the Union and the Confederacy, um, that I was willing to look at it from that place, from, you know, this new and unexpected place because uh, I have that knowledge of the landscape and ha having grown up here. And I think I was more willing to kind of look for the Civil War uh, in these like kind of hidden nooks and crannies. <laughs> You know, I could really tell because I could almost smell the mesquite, right? I felt like I was there. You put the reader in the action. You said you have nine characters in the book. Did you ever think about the landscape as your 10th character? Yes, yes, most definitely. Um, and actually early on, my editor asked me, you know, who is the heart of the book? Like what, who is the person that the, the readers are going to most kind of um, connect to? 
And I had a hard time answering that because I wasn't quite sure how readers would respond. And ultimately, as I said, I think it's Juanita. But initially, I thought, well, the, the high desert, the, the landscape is actually in many ways the heart of the book because all of these protagonists have to deal with it. All, and all of them um, engage with the landscape in, in completely different ways. And really, um, whoever is able to um, survive and also use uh, the natural resources in the area to most to their benefit uh, was the community that ended up succeeding. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I have to admit, I may be the only person in America that has never watched Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> I think that may be true. <laughs> Maybe, but I do know a good story when I read one. And I, um, you know, at the museum, we believe that people connect to history through stories, right? Yeah. You tell them a good story and they build a connection. How hard was it for you to choose those nine characters? Because uh, you must have left so many others out. Yes. Yeah, that was actually really difficult. Um, Alonzo Ickes was the first uh, protagonist I chose, I think because he was the first one who I sort of met uh, in the archive. And again, his diary, you know, his personality just kind of leaps off the page. And that was part of it. Um, whenever I would read a source, um, you know, Bill Davidson, who's a Confederate soldier um, from Texas, is similar to Ickes in that way. When you read his accounts of the war, his personality really comes through. And because I wanted to tell the story through individuals, I didn't want any of them to feel kind of two dimensional. I wanted to give them, I mean, even the, even the people in the book who are, who are the worst, right? Like, like John Baylor. Yeah. He's not a good guy, right? Um, yeah, the, to, just to put it lightly. Um, but he, he has elements to his character that, make you almost want to like him a little bit, which I think is fascinating. Like, and, and it's very real, right? Most people are very complicated and, and people are not two dimensional and they have very different reasons for doing different things. And so, you know, Baylor wrote, I, I found out from one of the letters he wrote to his wife that he wrote her love poems. Um, and unfortunately I could never find any of those poems. <laughs> um, I really wanted to, but you know, that gives him a sort of different, sort of sense um, and, and, and makes him even more complicated. So I was really looking for people I could use to tell the story of their larger community um, who were in important places and important moments. Uh, and also I needed some kind of critical mass of evidence. Um, and for some people there was abundant evidence for uh, James Carlton, for example, or Kit Carson, they produced a ton of material um, in their own words um, most often. Um, but then uh, protagonists like Louisa Camby and Juanita were very different. I actually had um, almost no, I, well, I had no records from this period for Louisa Camby at all. Um, she did not write a diary, much to my frustration, um, and she didn't write letters uh, that exist. Um, so I think she wrote them, but we, we don't have them. And so I didn't actually have her words, uh, which was difficult. I also did not have Juanita's words, um, but for both of them, I was able to track them because um, they, they were quite similar in the sense that they were both kind of army wives, right? They were married to men, uh, who had um, very important military and community roles and positions. And so um, everyone was always talking about uh, Louisa Camby's husband, Richard, and about Manuelito. So I could actually track them through the movements of their husbands because they went with them uh, wherever they were. So that was very helpful. And then other people also talked about them quite a fair bit, uh, which was very useful. So I was able to build... Uh, their stories uh, using a kind of multiplicity of sources. And for Juanita, I also used a great deal of uh, material culture, textile history, um, and also um, the oral histories coming out of the, the Navajo community itself. We are, um, thank you so much. We are getting a lot of questions. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. A lot of questions. So if you don't mind, I have a, one that I'll wrap up with, but let's just get to some of our audience questions. Someone was asking about 
Um, Megan, what impact did Union, Confederate, Cheyenne, Arapaho, do you see the Sand Creek Massacre on the Western campaigns? Mm -hmm. So how do we link the Sand Creek Massacre in the Civil War? Yes, so um, the Sand Creek Massacre takes place in November of 1864 and uh, is perpetrated by a Colorado uh, volunteer unit um, led by John Shivington, who is in fact the, the hero of Glorietta. He leads uh, the, the contingent that, that climbs Glorietta Mesa uh, and comes around the back of the Confederate line to burn that wagon train. Uh, he also took, he took part in the Apache Canyon fight as well, leading Colorado troops there. So he was a great hero. And in fact, Alonzo Ickes talks about him because he um, garrisons Fort Craig with John Shivington um, for a couple months in the, the summer, kind of late spring and summer of 1862, um, before Shivington goes back to Colorado and before um, <laughs> it gets, gets shipped out um, with his unit. So um, Shivington was actually quite well known um, in the region before the Sand Creek Massacre. Um, and that, you know, I think that's why he was given command um, of that particular unit. And Sand Creek is part of that larger story of the Union Army really asserting itself, asserting its power and a new kind of Indian policy, uh, which was not to make treaties, uh, but to declare war and make war first uh, in an effort to force surrender and removal. Um, and of course, Sand Creek is a little bit of an outlier uh, in the sense that it is, it was in fact a massacre and it did in fact prompt a congressional investigation. And the, the commission that came to the West to partly to uh, make treaties with um, many of the indigenous peoples in the plains um, in 1868, uh, they came uh, in order to actually um, assess the ground after, you know, that was a considerable amount of time after the Sand Creek Massacre, um, but a, a, another commission had come before then in 1865, and they were all investigating Sand Creek, they were investigating um, the Bear Creek Massacre, uh, which took place in Utah in January of 1863, uh, and they were investigating Bosque Redondo um, as places in which, and, and events um, in which you really see the Union Army enacting a new policy, but Congress actually feeling a little bit um, morally compromised by it um, and wanting to condemn extreme action and uh, but also making it very clear that Native peoples were going to have to submit and be civilized. Uh, in the wake of these violent encounters. So along those lines, we're getting a lot of questions about, could you talk a little bit more about um, Apache and Navajo mm -hmm. involvement and sort of com uh, compare contrast with the Comanche in Texas mm -hmm. and Southern Plains? Sure. Um, can you speak a little bit more about that? Sure. Yeah, sure. So I think that the thing to, keep in mind um, to remember is that each indigenous community had its own relationship with and with the Union Army and the Confederate Army if they ran into it and um, response to uh, civil war conflicts. Um, some groups did not experience any kind of um, civil war kind of military mobilization at all. Um, other groups uh, felt the effects of it a little bit later. Um, some, like the Pimas and Maricopas, who were farmers who cultivated land um, to the west of Tucson, actually became, it signed, well, they didn't actually sign any kind of treaty, but they came to an agreement with Carlton's California column and actually acted as the Union Army's quartermasters uh, during that march and during many of the campaigns to follow uh, in Arizona territory. So, the focus in the Three Cornered War on Chiricahua Apaches through the, the protagonist Mangus Coloradus, who was one of their war chiefs, um, and the Navajos um, through Juanita, these are two groups who really had an intensive interaction uh, with the Union Army. So uh, that may kind of 
skew uh, the overall sense of the picture um, of the Civil War kind of in the larger West. Um, I think we still need, a, I mean, we need a ton of work, um, new scholarly work uh, coming from Native American studies on um, individual indigenous polities and their experience of the Civil War. But in terms of this particular region, Chiricahua Apaches controlled uh, all of the territory between Mesilla on the Rio Grande and Tucson. And so the, there was a very important mail route that was also kind of a military route during this period that ran right through their territory. So Chiricahua Apaches kind of through the leadership of Mangus Coloradus and also Cochise and later Geronimo developed a kind of series of, of different responses. Sometimes um, they attacked uh, Union troops as they did at Apache Pass in July of 1862. Sometimes they attempted diplomacy as Mangus Colorado's tried to do with James Carleton um, in the, the winter of 62-63. Um, sometimes they merely charged them kind of a toll uh, to move through the country. Sometimes they ignored them completely and went down into Mexico. Um, so the story of, of the Chiricahua Apache's experience here is one of great variability, um, but also one of a kind of longer term um, kind of response to Civil War conditions and mobilization, but also, um, you know, one in which they very successfully uh, continued the war with the Union Army for many years after, you know, the Civil War ended at, at Appomattox. Navajos, um, because they were a singular focus of, of the campaign in January of 1864, which was led by Kit Carson, um, also had an extremely intensive experience uh, and a very different one. Um, so their surrender and the long walk to Bosque Redondo was somewhat unusual during this time period. And that's why Bosque Redondo gained so much attention um, from Congress and from political and military leaders outside of, of New Mexico also is it it was a bit of an experiment but it was also a, a prisoner of war camp. Um, James Carleton called Navajos at Bosque Redondo his prisoners. Um, he did not um, you know refer to them in in any kind of way and they were under the control of, of the War Department and so that shapes their uh, history and their response and the actions that they took um, to survive themselves and to persist um, from 1864 to 1868. Um, Comanches and, and their Kiowa allies kind of come into um, the story in an interesting way. Comanches actually, when Navajos, when they found out that Navajos were um, imprisoned at Bosque Redondo and they had, you know, smaller sheep herds than that they had had before, but they had sheep herds at Bosque Redondo. Comanches actually came up from, from the center of their homeland and raided Bosque Redondo and took sheep and horses uh, from Navajos who were imprisoned there. So there's still, um, Comanches are to, at a different, um, their timeline is also very different and their engagement with Confederate troops in Texas is a, a different story. Um, and by this time, really the 1860s, um, the Comanche Empire is, is kind of shrinking and their power is, is fading a little bit. Um, but again, I think what this all points to is that indigenous communities um, still held great power during this period. Um, and the Civil War is a really important moment because it really uh, mobilized soldiers and brought them into the region in much larger numbers than they had been before and really focused um, the War Department on creating a, an Indian policy uh, that really was meant to um, remove Native peoples from the path of white migrants uh, wherever they might want to go in the far west. Well, you do an excellent job in the book uh, showing that there is no one response. There's no pan-Indian response. It varies over time by individual or um, by clan, by group, by tribe or nation, um, and by circumstance. And did you feel any special responsibility? How did you approach telling these stories of indigenous people? Was that an extra layer of, as a historian, how did you do that? Yes, I definitely did. And, and one of the things I wanted to be careful with was to use 
indigenous sources as much as possible. Um, so for both Chiricahua um, history and Navajo history, I used oral histories produced by um, Navajo uh, historians and um, luckily published and um, made public uh, to historians like me who are not in the community so that we're able to, to access those. Um, also, because I had, especially for, for Navajos, they, they have a great museum in Window Rock. And that has, it tells a lot of the personal stories um, of, of the Navajo, not just during this period, but um, throughout their long history. And then I was also able to look at all kinds of different elements of uh, their material culture and textiles. I was able to see these in person. And that really gave me a sense of, um, you know, knowing how they made uh, the particular baskets that they always had with them uh, in their homes that they used for all different kinds of things for ceremonial purposes for um, you know storing seeds and distributing them and for telling stories um, these were the kinds of things that are produced by the community that really give you a, a really good window into uh, what their cultural culture and history uh, was like and the, the things that they found to be meaningful. So as much as possible, I mean, I did use uh, white authored sources and, you know, government records uh, because those are also extremely useful, um, but mostly to, to give you a sense of, of Apache and Navajo communities on the ground. Um, I relied most on, on the kinds of histories and the, the stories and the material culture that was coming from those communities themselves. Awesome. So uh, someone asked about Hispano peoples of New Mexico territory. What is their role? How do they react to Confederate and uh, increasing Anglos and Union soldiers coming into New Mexico? Yeah, so they, they were also um, a group that I think I maybe didn't mention um, where their loyalties were really uncertain at the beginning of the war because, uh, you know, they had only been with, you know, American citizens for a little more than 10 years. And for many of them, it was not really their choice, right? The, the border moved over them um, yeah. as a result of the Mexican-American War, the land session there, and then, and then also the Gadsden Purchase. And so, you know, some, some people living in the border region were given an option. They could kind of move south um, across the border and not be American citizens. But those who lived further north, you know, really had no choice. And it was unclear kind of whether they would throw their lot in with the Union or the Confederacy. Um, and Lincoln had really looked on New Mexico territory as a kind of border region uh, that he needed to contain. Um, and he, he gave some Democrats uh, civil appointments there um, and some Republicans in order to achieve that balance. Um, because, and there was another kind of element that, that readers will learn about in the Three Cornered War that made everything more complicated, and that is um, the widespread enslavement of Native peoples in Hispano households, um, in wealthier His Hispano households. Um, and that was all part of a, a very large um, network of both um, of enslavement and slave trading um, between and among indigenous groups and um, Hispanos in this region. So that Navajos and Apaches had Hispano slaves and Hispanos had Navajo and Apache slaves. So um, that sort of element of slavery and slavery being legal in New Mexico territory created some interesting tensions and problems, um, especially after the Emancipation Proclamation in January of 1863. And, and so this is why Henry Sibley actually thought that he would be able to convince uh, the majority of New Mexico's Hispanos to come, you know, come into the Confederate Army and to, you know, supply them with all of their agricultural products. Um, and there were 50,000 Hispanos living in New Mexico at this time. So that's a considerable population uh, and would have helped Sibley very much. However, <laughs> Sibley either forgot or did not know uh, that in 1841, Texans had tried uh, to invade New Mexico and take Santa Fe for themselves. Um, 
They had always claimed Santa Fe uh, in, a, in the wake of their rebellion against Mexico. They thought it belonged to them. And uh, so they marched an army of about 300 men um, to Santa Fe from Texas, which was a huge disaster. Many of them died along the way. By the time they got there, they were in no condition to fight. Um, and the, the Mexican military at that point was waiting for them and then shipped them off promptly to, to Mexico City as, as prisoners of war. And so um, Hispano New Mexicans had no love for Texans. <laughs> and so one of the major reasons, I mean, there were obviously they were protecting their homeland from invasion. So that's a very uh, uh, important motivation for joining a war effort. Um, but they, the fact that the Confederate army that came both with Baylor and then with Sibley was entirely made up of Texans uh, was a huge problem for them. Uh, and so they, they convinced a couple of um, prominent Ricos, sort of wealthier Hispanos to go with them. Um, the Armijo brothers are, an example of that, but for the most part, uh, most of the, the Hispano civilians in New Mexico threw in with the Union. Many of them volunteered uh, for the first New Mexico volunteers. And actually, one of the, the interesting things uh, that occurred here is that the army that Louisa Camby's husband um, put together to defend New Mexico was the most diverse army in the history of the American Civil War um, because it included. Hispano New Mexican uh, volunteers and officers and also militia. Uh, it included Anglo gold miners volunteers like Alonzo Ickes. It also included army regulars, you know, kind of professional soldiers who had been in the front, frontier garrisons for a little while. Um, and also uh, Ute and Pueblo scouts. Um, so this is, you know, this was not an integrated uh, army, but it is an extremely diverse army, um, both racially and also culturally, um, you know, first New Mexico, they spoke both English and Spanish. And this is more than a year uh, before the Emancipation Proclamation brought black soldiers into the army in the way that we're usually are thinking about kind of race um, and soldiering in the Civil War. So that gives us a totally new perspective. Um, but yes, uh, most Hispano New Mexicans were invested in the Union war effort. Uh, they resisted Confederate invasion in many different ways. Some of them served, some of them, they hid their provisions and would not sell them uh, or give them over to the Confederates. And they only would sell them to Union troops. Um, and then of course, they, along with um, Apaches and Navajos, you know, persisted, they stayed uh, and, you know, continued to, to live their lives um, after the Civil War had ended in the Far West. It, your book is so powerful at recentering the action in the West and you continually, you know, the, this diverse army, the likes of which hadn't been seen, or the first time the Confederates had uh, successfully captured uh, a Union capital city, uh -huh. Santa Fe, you know, all of these first, but that's not what we're taught in high school history class about the Civil War. Yeah. Um, why did it take so long for this book to be <laughs> written? Um, why is there a dearth of scholarship? Uh, or maybe that's changing. Maybe you can um, help share with us some other books that people write, might read to learn more about Civil War in the West. What can we do to learn more? Sure. Um, I think there are a couple of reasons why the far Western theater has not gotten much attention. Um, first, I think most Civil War history until about kind of maybe 20, 30 years ago was really military history that was focused almost entirely on the Eastern theater. I mean, even the Trans-Mississippi West doesn't get much action, right? And the only reason it does is because of Shiloh and because that's where we see the rise of Ulysses S. Grant and William Tecumseh Sherman. Uh, if they had not been in it or that had not gone well, I don't think we would know anything <laughs> about those. Uh, they would be similarly ignored. Um, and even when you, I mean, I think if you look at most even textbooks about the Civil War or other books, whenever they show the kind of seat of war map, it's half the map of the United States mm -hmm. sort of ends uh, at West Texas. And, it, and so you're like, well, then of course nothing happened off the map is it doesn't exist. It's not actually there. Um, also, the terminology hasn't helped. The fact that most Civil War historians, you know, today also 
when they talk about the West, what they're really talking about is the Trans-Mississippi West. They're talking about Arkansas and Louisiana and parts of Tennessee and, um, and Kansas and Missouri and parts of Indian Territory, but they're not talking about the far West, right? So, so one of my goals has been to try and get Civil War historians to, to just say, it's the Eastern Theater, the Trans-Mississippi, and the West, <laughs> the, the real West, <laughs> um, you know, so um, because words really matter, terms matter. And so if, you know, if you're calling the trans Mississippi the West, then it's hard to imagine what's West of there, right? Um, <laughs> it's like, what does that even mean? Um, but I think there has been an increasing attention to the war in this region. Um, one great book, if people are interested in, in the Sand Creek Massacre and its significance um, in kind of shaping the Civil War as an Indian War, um, Ari Kalman's uh, A Misplaced Massacre is a wonderful book, Bancroft Prize winning, uh, really tremendous writing, beautiful book, and kind of haunting book also. Um, there are also uh, two books that have come out recently, who, of course, the titles I'm going to mess up. Um, I have them. I have them in my bookshelf, like right over there. And I'm trying to um, Coast to Coast Empire um, is one of them by William Kaiser, and so that is a um, focuses again on the Southwest, and it is a more um, pretty hardcore kind of military and political history. Although he also kind of goes uh, crosses the border into Mexico. So if you're interested in borderland issues, um, that is a good book for you. I think. Um, and there are, I mean, this is a burgeoning field. It's a little bit like Civil War environmental history too, where the number of books are just kind of growing and growing. And there are a lot of people who are uh, focusing on different um, battlefields, different indigenous groups. There's a, um, there are a couple people now working on the Dakota War of 1862, mm -hmm. uh, which took place in Minnesota uh, and involves the, the um, Dakota, people and their response to civil war engagement, which included kind of making war on the, the Union Army um, and the disastrous effects for them um, as a community um, in the wake of that conflict. So, um, so that, that, I think there's a lot of exciting work to come. Excellent. I always uh, you know, tell students and visitors that there are so many opportunities to write history on the West and in Colorado in particular. Um, there's so much work to be done. We barely began to scratch the surface. This work, your work is such a gift to our understanding of Colorado in the West. So I wanna, I, I don't really wanna end our conversation, but I wanna be <laughs> respectful of people's time. I'm gonna make one more pitch that people go out and buy the book because I think I told you, Megan, yeah. I, I think I said I came for the, uh, the writing style and I stayed for the history, but I think I came for the history and I stayed for the writing style because it is a beautifully written book and it's powerful. It has so much to share with us, um, again, in recentering the West and the Civil War. But we always like, at the museum, we like to make history connect to the present. So mm -hmm. what is the Civil War legacy for Coloradoans? How can we see it? How, do we, how does it make sense to us and why does it matter? Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a really great, great question, and it's something we really have to reckon with. I think one of the major components, um, kind of tensions that we see in Colorado and in the kind of larger kind of West-Southwest during the Civil War and now is this conflict between state and federal power, right? Like, what, like how, how are people going to be controlling their communities on the ground? Um, and then how do we have federal um sort of institutions um like the union army coming in and shaping um experiences there and setting policy um you know someone like john clark who is one of the protagonists of the book who is the surveyor general of new mexico territory and likely none of you have ever heard of him before um and he was a great joy to find as a protagonist because he wrote 27 volumes of diaries that were super easy wow. to read. Um, yes, between wow. 61 and 68, yes. And he, um, you know, he was a Republican appoint appointee. He knew Lincoln. Um, so he was this sort of representative of federal power and he was a surveyor, right? So he was uh, really focused on developing 
resources. And I think this is something, you know, that has always been a part of Colorado's history, you know, especially <clears throat> if we consider this history of the Colorado gold rush, um, which by the way, if you're more, if you're interested in reading about that, there's a classic book by Elliot West called The Contested Plains, which just does a really beautiful job mm -hmm. of tracking that gold rush and its significance um, for the Rocky Mountains and for the Plains, um, for indigenous groups uh, that had already been uh, here and claimed Colorado as part of their, ter their territory before you know, my white migrants even came in. Um, but then also the, <clears throat> the migrants who came from the, the Midwest and really founded Denver City and created the territory of Colorado right before the Civil War began in the February of 1861. Um, so the, I think those two major elements, the sort of natural resources and how um, to either exploit them or preserve them, um, what role that plays in the kind of fights and debates about that, uh, how that shapes communities is really significant to Colorado's history. And again, the, the the whole idea of state and federal kind of power and influence. Um, who, who actually has the power in our communities is a major question. It's an enduring question, I think, for Westerners and also for historians. Well said. Uh, my final question to you is, what are you working on now? Oh, so you may see like over this shoulder. So this is my Civil War bookshelf. <laughs> This is my new project bookshelf, which is a reconstruction bookshelf. Um, so the next book is called This Strange Country, uh, Yellowstone and the Reconstruction of America. Uh, and it is about, it tells the story of the 1871 scientific survey to Yellowstone, mm. which resulted in the 1872 Yellowstone Act, which created the first national park in the world. So it's, it's a much more tightly focused book. It's only the time frame is about a year and a half. Um, it also focuses on protagonists, uh, but they are more place-based uh, and, and there are fewer of them uh, <laughs> than nine. Um, but the focus there is really on how, it's, it's almost a, a sequel to the Three Cornered War in a certain way because it has a lot of roots in, in the Civil War history of the West. Um, but it is really focused on how Americans in the years after the war are you know, trying to come back together, um, but there are obvious rifts and divides and great violence occurring um, in the North, in the, certainly in the South uh, and in different parts of the West and how federal government agencies and scientists and artists um, and writers are trying to, uh, kind of control all of that and also bring the country back together through a kind of nationalist project like Yellowstone. Fantastic. I hope you'll join us maybe in person in Colorado yes. <laughs> when that book comes out. Absolutely, yes. We can get you here. Well, I, um, I want to thank my colleagues uh, Meg Poole and Michaela Warden for handling the tech uh, setup for today. I want to thank all of our audience members for joining us. We wish everyone well. We hope you stay safe and healthy, and we can't wait to see you at the museum sometime soon. And then, I, finally, I just want to thank you, um, Meg and Kate Nelson. This was phenomenal. We're thrilled that you were able to spend some time with us. I hope lots and lots and lots of people go buy the book. It's such a great read. And um, thank you. We hope to see you in Colorado when you're able. To oh, come yes, I cannot wait. And until then, stay safe, be well. And thank you again for having me here. This was great. Thank you, Megan. Thanks. Take care. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.